Ever wondered why people live where they do? Why some places are so crowded while others are practically empty? This isn't just a matter of personal preference or a game of real estate roulette, it's about something called global settlement patterns. Settlement patterns are how populations spread across the globe. Imagine a vast canvas dotted with clusters of color. Each cluster represents a community, a city, a town. Some are tightly packed, others are scattered, and others still are arranged in neat lines. These are what we call clustered, scattered, and linear patterns of settlement. Now let's take a closer look at these patterns. Clustered settlements are like a bustling city square. Picture the hustle and bustle of New York City or Tokyo. People are drawn together by shared resources like jobs, schools, and shopping centers. Scattered settlements, on the other hand, are like stars splattered across the night sky. Think of the sprawling ranches of Texas or the remote villages in the Swiss Alps. These are places where the land is vast and people are spread out, each with their own little piece of heaven. Then, there are linear settlements, stretched out like a string of pearls. These are often found along rivers, coastlines or roads, where the geography dictates the layout. Imagine the long, winding villages along the Nile River, or the houses hugging the Pacific Coast Highway. But it's not just about the layout, it's also about density. Some places, like Hong Kong or Mumbai, are densely populated with millions of people squeezed into a small area. Other places like the Sahara Desert or the Arctic Tundra are sparsely populated with only a handful of people braving the harsh conditions. So, people live in different places in different ways. But what decides where and how they settle? Is it the luck of the draw, or is there more to it? As we'll discover, it's a complex interplay of geography, resources, and human choice. Let's delve deeper. Imagine trying to build a house on a steep hill, or in the middle of a desert. Not so easy, right? Our planet's physical environment has a huge influence on where humans decide to settle. This is because different environmental factors present unique challenges and opportunities. For example, imagine trying to farm on a mountainside or build skyscrapers on marshy land. Pretty tricky, huh? Let's start with climate. If an area is too hot, too cold, too dry, or too wet, it could be difficult for people to live there. For instance, you don't see many cities in the middle of the Sahara Desert or the Antarctic Tundra, do you? Next we have soil and topography. These factors are especially crucial for agricultural settlements. After all, you can't grow crops without good soil. And a flat land is a lot easier to farm than a hilly one. Physical features of the land like mountains, rivers, and oceans can also impact where people settle. Mountains can act as natural barriers while rivers and oceans provide opportunities for trade and travel. Ever wonder why so many major cities are located near water? Now you know. Water availability is another key factor. Humans need water to drink, to grow food and for many of our industries. That's why you'll often find settlements near lakes, rivers, and springs. Finally, natural resources play a big role too. Towns and cities often spring up around valuable resources like oil, coal, gold, or even good agricultural land. These resources provide jobs and income, attracting people to settle nearby. But it's not just about what the environment can offer us. The environment also sets limits on human activity. For instance, we can't build houses in flood-prone areas or farm on rocky terrain, and places with extreme climates require special adaptations like insulated homes in cold regions or air conditioning in hot ones. So, the environment plays a big role in where we settle. But what about the land we choose to settle on? That's a whole other story. Ever heard of the saying, they aren't making more land? Well, it's true and it's causing some problems. Imagine you've got a pie, a delicious mouth-watering pie. But there's a catch. You have to share it with everyone in your neighborhood. Yep, you heard it right. Everyone. Now we all want a piece of that pie, don't we? But what if some folks want a larger piece than others? That's where the trouble starts. This, my friends, is the conundrum of land use. We've got a limited amount of land and everyone wants a piece. Farmers need it for agriculture, industries need it for factories, people need it for houses, and then there's transportation, recreation, and wilderness areas. And let's not forget the indigenous groups who have lived on these lands for centuries and claim it as rightfully theirs. Oh, and then there are the ecologically sensitive areas. These are places where the environment is so delicate that any human activity could tip the balance and cause irreversible damage. These places are like the last piece of pie when everyone's still hungry. So, what happens when there's so much competition for the pie, erm, land? Well that's when different groups step in. Municipal, state and national governments, local residents, environmental groups and non-governmental organizations all join the fray. Some people argue that we need to prioritize agriculture to feed our growing population. 
Others say that industrial development is key to economic growth. Then there are those who believe that we should leave some land untouched to preserve nature and protect indigenous rights. And let's not forget those who argue for housing and recreational spaces. It's like a tug of war where everyone's pulling in different directions. But remember, in the end, it's all about sharing that pie fairly and sustainably. Land is a precious resource. We need to use it wisely. But are we? Let's see. Cities are getting bigger and bigger, but why? And what does it mean for our planet? Today, more than ever, we're witnessing a global trend of migration from rural to urban areas. Picture this, a family from a small farm, packing up their belongings and moving to a bustling city. This isn't just happening in one corner of the world, it's happening everywhere. From New York to New Delhi, this trend is driven by the search for better job opportunities, education, healthcare, and lifestyle. But what happens when everyone starts flocking to the cities? Well, it leads to something we call urban sprawl. This is when cities start to spread out, covering more and more land. Imagine a pancake on a griddle, slowly expanding as it cooks. That's our cities for you, stretching out in all directions, swallowing up forests, meadows, and anything else in their path. Now, you might be thinking, isn't there a limit to how far a city can spread? That's where land reclamation comes into play. This is when we create new land from oceans, riverbeds, or even deserts to accommodate the growing population. Picture a giant sandbox, but instead of sandcastles, we're building skyscrapers. However, this urban expansion doesn't come without a cost. As cities burgeon, they often encroach upon natural habitats. Imagine a deer looking out from a forest edge to see a field of concrete where its meadow used to be. This loss of natural habitat is a significant concern as it threatens biodiversity, the magical variety of life on Earth. And there's another side to this coin. While cities are growing, some regions are experiencing a different trend. In certain countries, people are moving away from major cities to smaller towns. They're seeking a slower pace, closer communities, and the charm of small town life. So, our settlement patterns are changing, but what impact does this have on our environment? Well, stay tuned because that's what we're diving into in the next scene. Ever notice how a city's lights can blot out the stars at night? That's just one way our settlements affect the environment. Let's delve into this a little more. Our settlements, whether they're bustling cities or quiet rural towns, have a significant impact on the environment. For starters, consider water pollution. Industries release waste into rivers and oceans, agriculture introduces harmful chemicals, and even our own waste can contaminate our water sources. This pollution not only harms aquatic life but also affects the quality of water we depend on. Then there's air pollution. Those exhaust fumes from vehicles and smoke from factories aren't just disappearing into thin air. They're contributing to the smog that hangs over our cities and the greenhouse gases that drive climate change. Next up, we've got soil contamination. Pesticides from farming, industrial byproducts, and even our everyday garbage can degrade the quality of soil, making it harder for plants to grow and for us to use the land effectively. And let's not forget about deforestation. As our settlements expand, we're cutting down forests and other natural habitats, leaving many species without homes. This loss of biodiversity is a huge problem, and it's happening right in our backyards. On top of all this, our growing cities are swallowing up agricultural land, making it harder to grow the food we need. And have you ever noticed how bright cities can be at night? That's light pollution, and it can disrupt the natural rhythms of wildlife, and even our own sleep cycles. Lastly, there's desertification. Some agricultural practices aren't sustainable and can turn fertile land into deserts over time. This makes it even harder to grow crops and support human life. It's clear our settlements have a big impact on the environment. But what can we do about it? We've heard about recycling and saving water, but did you know these are ways to make our settlements more sustainable? Every day, people all over the world are finding new ways to live more sustainably. And it's not just about the big stuff like wind farms or solar panels, it's about the small changes we make in our everyday lives too. Take water for instance. By fixing leaky faucets, taking shorter showers, and installing low-flow appliances, we can significantly reduce the amount of water we use. This is particularly important in areas where water is scarce. Then there's recycling and composting. Ever wondered what happens to your soda can or banana peel after you toss it? Well, if it's recycled or composted, it can be turned into something new, like a bicycle or nutrient-rich soil for growing plants. This not only reduces waste but also saves energy and resources. But sustainable living isn't just about what we do at home, it's also about the choices we make in our communities. For example, 
Choosing to use public transit, cycle, or walk instead of driving can reduce air pollution and traffic congestion. Plus, it's a great way to sneak in some exercise. And what about where we choose to build our homes? By limiting construction on agricultural land, we can ensure there's enough space to grow the food we need. Plus, it helps to maintain the natural beauty of our countryside. Finally, there's the simple act of planting trees. Trees don't just provide shade and habitat for wildlife, they also absorb carbon dioxide, helping to combat climate change. So by planting and maintaining trees in our neighborhoods, we're not only creating green spaces for everyone to enjoy, but we're also doing our bit for the planet. All these actions might seem small, but when we all pitch in, they can add up to big changes. And the best part? We're not just making our lives better, we're making the world a better place for future generations. So, we can make a difference. But how can we understand all this better? Let's talk about maps. Maps are not just for finding your way to the nearest ice cream shop, they can help us understand complex issues like human settlement. Imagine a map as a superhero, not the kind that flies around in a cape but one that helps us visualize and solve complex problems. One such superhero map is the Choropleth map, a special type of map that uses different colors or shades to represent statistical data. Picture a world map with different countries shaded in various colors. The darker the shade, the higher the population density. This is a simple example of a Choropleth map. With just a glance, we can identify where people are clustered around the world. Now let's take our superhero map a step further. Remember how we discussed the influence of the environment on human settlement? We can use a Choropleth map to visualize this too. For instance, we could shade areas based on the availability of water. Darker shades could represent regions with abundant water, while lighter shades might represent drier regions. Instantly, we could see how water availability might affect where people choose to live. Choropleth maps can also help us understand land use issues. Think about a map showing different land uses. Agriculture, industry, housing, and more. Each type of use could be represented by a different color. With such a map, it becomes easier to identify where conflicts might arise like where industrial development is encroaching on agricultural land, and what about trends in human settlements like urban sprawl or migration from rural to urban areas? Yep, you guessed it, our superhero map can tackle that too. We could use different shades to represent the rate of urbanization in different regions. In the same way, these maps can be used to illustrate the environmental impacts of human settlements and the practices adopted to make settlements more sustainable. Maps can be a powerful tool in understanding and addressing the challenges of human settlement. So what have we learned? Well we've learned that with the right tools like our superhero Choropleth map, we can visualize complex issues and work towards solutions, after all every superhero needs a super tool right? We've covered a lot today, from why people live where they do to how we can make our settlements more sustainable. We've explored the different patterns of human settlement across the globe, and how factors like climate, soil, and topography can steer where we choose to set up our homes. We dove into the pressing issues of land use where agriculture, industry, housing, and recreation all compete for space, and the responses from various groups to these challenges. We also discussed the current trends in human settlement, including the global shift from rural to urban living, and how these changes are impacting our environment. Finally, we learned about sustainable practices that can make our settlements more eco-friendly, from recycling to using public transit. And let's not forget the fascinating world of Choropleth maps, which can tell us so much about population density and land usage. Remember, every one of us plays a role in shaping our world, so let's make it a better place for all.